Hello humans, we have got a very special box of tricks for you today. If you recall, we previously put out an episode where we recreated an aerial bombing raid from World War II using this over here. And today, the writer-director of that short film that that was the opening shot for has brought in a 132 scale Lancaster bomber that he has lovingly put together. He's had airbrushed and motors and all this kind of joy. I need to stop talking about it. Said box of tricks is down there. So uh, JP and Martin are gonna open it up and show us the wonders. So I'm joined by writer-director Martin here, who's going to talk us through not only this amazing model, but about your film project. Yes. Um, so the short film is actually about uh, a child who's on a visit to a, a museum yeah. that actually has a Lancaster based on a real museum up in Lincolnshire, okay. um, where we have to shoot it. Um, so it's about uh, a child's visit to this museum where she bumps into an elderly gentleman who ultimately teaches her about the importance of remembrance of Bomber Command. Um, and the unique thing I want to do with the film is not only have, a, have it set in present time, because that'd be too easy. Right. So it, it will include scenes of both the past and present as she learns about Bomber Command. So we'll have a very small snippet of the life that they went through, the young, the young crew of Bomber Command, um, you know, from moments on the base to what they went through when they were in the skies. In our previous episode that featured this project, we focused mainly on the aerial views seen at the very start of the opening sequence. Later on in the film, we see the bombers in flight, and this is where the miniature of our Lancaster bomber comes in. We will ultimately be shooting this miniature with a motion control rig to give some dynamic moves to the aircraft as well as the camera. This off-the-shelf model kit isn't exactly cheap, but compared with a bespoke scratch-built miniature, it's actually very cost-effective. Martin installed miniature DC motors for the propellers and the topside gun turret, as well as installing a rear rigid metal box tube to allow easy rigging onto our motion control rig. Here we take a deep dive into the general pros and cons of using an off-the-shelf model kit to be used as a shooting miniature. So this model is an off-the-shelf kit, is that right? Correct, yes. So it's the HK Models uh, 132 scale. It's Lancaster big. Bar yeah, <laughs> it's the biggest one <laughs> you can buy off the shelf. Right. Um, and I remember this came about because initially you got in touch with me because you saw me put a post up asking for a CG artist. Yes. And you approached me and you went, would you consider doing this practically? Which for me is a huge fan of practical effects. I was like, oh, this can be done practically. Okay, I'm interested. And we talked quite a bit about how we'd achieve it. Yeah. And we, we both agreed that... If it can be done for real, let's try and do affordably. it. Affordably. Yeah, well, yeah, affordably, <laughs> exactly. Like, the <laughs> best thing to do is modify an off-the-shelf yeah. model, and this yeah. was the literally the largest one that is yeah. available. It's the daddy. It's the beast. Yeah. It's incredible. So for this to fit <clears throat> the time period, the look, the, the requirements for your vision, your script, did you have to do any alterations to this model kit uh, as a, it came? A, a few, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, so part of the script is um, an el elderly gentleman now talking about the past. And I was very conscious that, you know, we're unfortunately we're already having a lot of veterans passing away. Mm -hmm. For an elderly gentleman to be able to be in the kind of his state of health talking about that time, it would need to be near the end of the war right. for it to actually make sense. Okay. So I already knew that I needed to have a later Mark Lancaster. Um, and equally, as part of the, you know, as the shooting process of the short film, fingers crossed, hopefully going to be shooting um, ground uh, static Lancaster scenes with a, a real one. Full size. Full size. Great. Um, at the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre, which they've got a ground operating Lancaster, which is incredible because there's only two 
flying I was in the gonna, world at the moment. I was going to say that it's it's always been the front of my mind where even you know big well known Hollywood films that used period correct real aircraft you know there's only a handful left that are in yeah there's two that fly and <laughs> from what i know I might be wrong on this especially in the uk there's only one other that runs which is right. um, just jane at the, which is uh yeah nx611 just jane that's at the lincolnshire aviation heritage center so you can pay to have taxi runs and things like that it's an incredible museum and knowing i was going to hopefully film yeah. with nx611 you know, she's a, a Mark Seven Lancaster that was built in 1945. Funny enough, at the Longbridge plant in Birmingham, so not far from right. where I'm from. Is, okay. So yeah, there's a nice little nugget there. But um, so she's a you know 1945 Lancaster. I've got to be conscious about the age of the the guy that's in the, the elderly gentleman in the film. But the off-the-shelf HK models was a Mark One Lancaster. Right. Okay. Which, funnily enough handily comes with a few extra bits to make it a later one. It, you mentioned before, is it this yeah. radar So pod? this is the H2S, well, the H2S radar lived underneath there. Okay. Um, and this isn't actually in the instruction manual with the kit. No? But it actually just comes in the box. Oh, just in the box. And when you see the shade <laughs> of it, you're like, ah, oh, okay, that, I kind of need that to make it a later <laughs> model, which was very handy. Right. Um, so details such as that, but something more complicated was... Yeah, actually, the Mark One actually had windows that ran up the fuselage. Right, okay. And so what we had to do was painstakingly fill them in and sand them off and hope that the paint job would cover up our... It does. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot detect. I mean, by chance, it's actually <laughs> added a bit more texture to the body that has actually helped us with the weathering process. Yeah. Because I think the problem with models, if you're trying to make them look used, they can almost look a bit too perfect. Yes. So us actually having to sand down parts, dull down some of the panels and some of the grooves, which essentially has allowed us, when we did the weathering at the end, it allowed it to kind of add more texture to the fuselage. Yeah. No, you've done a wonderful job, and, and you've done what's very tricky sometimes to do with models or miniatures for, for film work, which is where you not only can make it look great to the eye, but to the most importantly to the camera. So the weathering that you've done isn't too heavy, it isn't too light. You've got indications of dings and scratches and things that are scale appropriate, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like you were saying before, where you were very conscious in doing the weathering and the paint job, you know, what may have caused that yeah. distress or that or scorch mark or that scratch and what have you. And they're all the things in, in selling a miniature to look bigger in scale because we're so familiar in the real world of seeing what real objects look like and how they age and all get damaged or yeah. worn and all that stuff. And it's all those little visual cues that if you can include in a paint job or a finish, like you were saying, the way the light can reflect off it or not reflect on a more worn area. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. You've done a, a top job on that. So who helped you with the paint job? I was just about to say, <laughs> I, can't, I can't claim to have completed this myself. Okay. So a very close friend of mine, um, Simon Greenaway from a little company called Sigma Arts yeah. um, up in the West Midlands, he very much um, specialises in airbrushing. and He actually does a lot of scale um, busts and models. Yeah. Of like characters, that's his main trade. Like collectible collectibles, collectibles, figures. figures. Yeah, okay. um, you know, rare, limited edition runs where there's only ten of them ever made. Um, you know, he gets commissions from you know private owners that own one. He also gets commissions off the people that actually get these things made, and we'll get him to paint the prototype, and then um, you know a factory will then copy his paint. So you know he. He knows his stuff, and, and years ago, before it even became a profession for him, I'd go around his house and he'd he'd have like a full scale gremlin that would be perfect detail, <laughs> and he'd go to the extent of being getting the hair made to be put oh. on the head for stripe. You know, there'd be moments you walk into his kitchen in his mom's house and you'd be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was considering doing this, I knew I would not be able to do this level of a, a finish on it. I knew I'd built Airfix. Uh, models and things as a kid. Yeah, my dad very much got me that into that as a young age. He he does he builds model railways in great detail. 
So I, I, growing up with, you know, those skills, I hadn't used them in years, but I was pretty confident I could put a, sure. a large scale kit yeah. together. And the candy thing is, being this scale, you're not working with tiny. <laughs> it's gonna actually say, a bit easier to do it. This, I was going to say, does it make size? it easier? I guess yeah. in some ways it does. It really does. I mean, the framework in all this, like, you know, being able to work on 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 lot the the detail inside the cockpit was actually a lot easier on a larger model. Yeah. Um, though the detail is greater. Um, but I got to a certain extent, kind of on my table at home, and then when it got to <laughs> really kind of getting the main body of it together, you know, Simon was just like, "Yeah, come down to the workshop. Let's 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 get it built." And so having his knowledge there for stuff like that. And then when it came, I went through so much stress with the right colours. And it's actually quite hard because when you think of camo, you think, oh, I'll get that. And we he wanted we wanted to mix the paint ourselves rather than getting off the shelf. Yeah, yeah. And you start realising when you're looking at photos of aircraft with camouflage on, obviously the lighting conditions and the colour temperature of the camera at the time dictates what you're looking at. So you start looking at countless images of Lancasters and Spitfires, well, not presume, one the camo matches. Well, think of it today, you know, getting a paint that matches isn't always easy, right? So no, yeah. if you're, and especially period specific, mm -hmm. you know, what precise amount of yellow is gonna be in that green yeah. of that batch of paint that was yeah, made yeah, yeah. for that area, it's... Um, Oh, it's amazing, and I can just tell the detail and the work that you and Simon have done just with the paint finish is incredible. Yeah, I mean, I, I did some. I, the one thing I can brag about is I did a lot. I did all the masking around the windows. That was me. Yeah, but as far pit. as I did, I did a little bit of painting here and there, and he kind of trained me while he was doing it as well. He did the majority of it. Yeah. But even when we were weathering, he'd start doing it off, and he'd be like, "Well, you can see I'm doing it now. He's the brush." Great. He was like, you yeah. just give me a shout if you if you start Amazing. struggling. So, you know, some of the weathering I got involved with, all the airbrushing stuff like this was all Simon. Yeah. Um, you know, and even the stains, the exhaust stains coming down the wing. Yeah. We, we'd look at loads of photos and some of them, it'd be coated on the real thing. And then you're like, do we go that far or do we hold it back? What is the right amount? Yeah. And just making those decisions, we're just constantly looking at reference photos and... It shows, you know, it shows that you've, yeah, you've, mm -hmm. you've paid that attention to detail and uh, yeah, great, great work, Simon, and yourself doing that. That's incredible stuff. Well, all your hard work has definitely paid off by the looks of it and we <laughs> really you. look forward to filming it and hopefully completing the sequence that you have in mind for your short film and maybe offering up a few other shots just oh, yeah, be for amazing. fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for joining us and we wish you all the best with uh, the film and we'll obviously be uh, in integral with the opening sequence uh, as long as you allow us to be. <laughs> no, no problem and thank you so much for uh, being willing to take this on. I'm really excited. I can't stop looking at it. It's going to be a very boring video. It's just uh, We're both looking down all the time because it's <laughs> yeah, just, just such, such an amazing... Yeah. Uh, Object. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna continue <laughs> playing with this. You firing up the Fill engines. Your boots. It's. Oh, <laughs> it's like the most amazing. I'm not. It, it, by no shape is it a toy, but it feels like a lot of fun to play with. But we will uh, update you very soon with some cool-looking shots. If you'd like to follow Martin's film project or even help to get it made, check out his GoFundMe page link in the description. In our follow-up episode in the series, we will show you how we will mount and shoot this model on our homemade motion control rig. This is JP, till next time.